away from that flame. Sometimes I flail my arms. <laughs> yes. Happy Mother's Day to all you moms. Yes. Now today I want to preach to the children of moms. <laughs> That's not to say anything about the quality of the mothering you've received. But I think that covers everybody. But I also want to preach to the choir today. I want to preach to the choir because the choir is responsible to sing to the Lord a new song. And when I talk about the choir, I mean the church. So when the choir learns a new song, you know, it takes some getting used to. Because a new song, it challenges our preferences, it stretches our imaginations, it seeks to engage our, our hearts and inform our minds. And a new song also shapes our perspective and it changes our perception. Now, maybe you don't think about that all the time when you're listening to a song, but if you have a favorite hymn, there's a reason why it's your favorite. If you have a, if maybe as a couple, you have a, a song that's yours. It's the song that the two of you, whenever you hear it, you know all of the words. You know, it's, a, it's your song. Because it has that kind of impact on you. So I want to preach to the choir because the choir needs to learn the new song. To rehearse the new song and then to present it to the Lord before a watching world and, and all the hosts of, of heaven and all the saints who have gone before us. Sing to the Lord, the text says, a new song. It's a command. And if we are to sing to the Lord a new song, we must answer a few questions that'll help our hearts. What is the new song? To whom is it sung? What is its content and by whom is it sung? So what is the new song? Good verses one and two. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Now, there are at least nine times in the scripture from the Old and to, to the New Testament where this phrase, a new song, is used. Psalm 96, just a couple of chapters earlier, a few songs earlier, Psalm 96 says the same thing about singing to the Lord a new song. And it's, a, and it's another psalm commanding us to sing. Psalm 98, you might say, is a remix. It's a reprise of, of Psalm 96. But here's what the new song is. The new song is a constantly fresh melody that is inspired by the victorious acts of deliverance that God himself performs, revealing his righteousness and triumph over evil. See, God is in the business of saving. And when there are, so the scripture tells us this, when there was no one to act on behalf of righteousness, and remember what the Bible tells us, that there is none righteous, no, not even one. God himself goes to work. He says this in Isaiah 59, verses 14 and 16. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. Sounds like he was reading the newspaper today, doesn't it? So God, but God went to work. He went to work and provided the righteousness that no one else could produce. Not Antifa. Not QAnon, not BLM, not the politicians on the right, 
or the left, not even the Constitution of the United States. None of them can produce for you and I the righteousness that God is looking for. See, this lets us know that the new song didn't originate with people. It didn't originate with us, but it originates with God in heaven. And he inspires the new song. This is what Revelation 5, 8 through 10 tells us, because this is the same, this is the scene in heaven. It's the scene in eternity that John saw. He says, and when he had taken the scroll, talking about the lamb, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So you see the new song, the new song originates in heaven, and it's inspired by the Lord. Tim Riesinger in his analysis of the new song, he writes this about the new song, and he rightly points this out. The new song is about God's mighty redemptive acts toward the world and his conquering all of his enemies, Satan, and the kingdoms of the world he controls. Yeah, yeah, you might know that guy. You see, when truth, when truth is stumbling in the public square and uprightness couldn't enter, God went to work. And when God goes to work, watch out. Darkness flees because light has come. Lies are restrained because truth has put it in handcuffs. See, when God goes to work, he makes the one who had been the prey of injustice the predator of injustice. See, when the Lord goes to work, the act of saving is so powerful and, and so prevailing that it fires the furnaces of the hearts of people and angels, producing new songs over and over again. A new song, a fresh melody inspired by the victorious acts of deliverance that God himself performs, revealing his righteousness and triumph over evil. But to whom is it sung? Look at verses 1, 4, and 6. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. Make a joyful noise, verse 4, to the Lord. All the earth break forth in the joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. You see, the new song is to the Lord. It's before the Lord, the King. Now, I know as in America, we're not used to kings because we all think that we are kings and queens. We're, we're the royalty. You know, but in the court of the king, the music, the music that is performed isn't criticized by the attendants. You see, it might cost you your life to criticize the music that's meant for the king. You see, you don't, see, this is the other thing, you don't get to claim the music that is for the king as your own. No, it's his praise. It's intended for the king and no one else. And similarly, the new song is to the Lord. You see, the joyful noise is to the Lord. The trumpet and the instruments that are played are before the Lord. And say, I don't know that I don't know that we get what the Bible is saying about the new song that it's to the Lord, it's before the Lord, because you know this means this means then that the songs, the new song, it's not about my likes, it's not about my dislikes, you know, it's not about it's not about my my tastes, it's not about my preferences, but it's what the Lord 
the king prefers. Now, I know with some believers that the default mode of their hearts is that the songs must be to their liking. I can't go to that church. I don't like the music. There's too many verses. It repeats itself too much. Those songs are all from long time ago. They need to get up to date, come into the 21st century. Oh, you see, we're commanded, though, to sing a new song to the Lord. See, if during worship you think that the songs are for you, then you're seeking, you're seeking to take something that doesn't belong to you. You see, when the new song is sung right, our attention is turned to the Lord and not ourselves. So this means you, you must know, you have to know, what is the song's content? Look at verses 1 and 3. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. So you see, the song's content is about the steadfast covenanted love of God for his people that results in their salvation. These are the marvelous things he's done. And so the lyrical content, the lyrical contents is it's, it's his right hand. It's his holy arm. It's the revelation of his righteousness in, in the sight of the nations. It's him coming to judge the world and, and people with righteousness and equity. The right hand and, and holy arm of the Lord is the power of God that's displayed in our salvation. His righteousness that is, that's revealed in the sight of the nations is seen in the deliverance of his multi-ethnic people. Salvation, Jonah says from the belly of the fish, is of the Lord. But where does the content... You see, this song... You know, and this is good news, folks. The song put on flesh. And where does that happen? Where, where does the content of the new song come together in flesh and bone? Because before, you know, it, it, this, yeah, there was the opening of the Red Sea, but even that wasn't convincing to some. Where is it that the new song, where is it that, this, that, that, that God's right hand, his, his holy arm, the revelation of his righteousness, all of these are, are abstract. Where is it that they become concrete? It's in the sight. It, all of this is done in the sight of the nations, but so then they had to see it. Where, when does it happen? Well, all of it comes together. It all becomes concrete. The song becomes flesh in Jesus Christ. You see, in Christ, God remembers his steadfast love and faithfulness. Jesus, see, Jesus, he's the righteous man who intercedes on our behalf, what Isaiah 59, God was looking for. Jesus is that man. Hallelujah. You see, Jesus foretold, he foretold what his death would do in John chapter 12. In verse 32, he said, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And Paul would show the universal triumph of Christ on the cross when he writes in Colossians 2, and you who were dead in your trespasses and sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And here it is. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. You see, the scripture also teaches the cosmic consequences of Christ's saving work in, in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 and 11, through to 11. Where Paul is talking about himself and his, and his ministry to, to the mystery of the gospel. He says, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is 
the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Do you see? Do you see the content of the new song? It all comes together. The song becomes flesh in Jesus Christ. The marvelous thing that the Lord has done is this new people gathered in Christ. People from every nation, tribe, and language, and tongue. This is, this is, this is the marvelous thing that God has done. The righteousness revealed in the sight of the nations is Jesus Christ dying in our place on the cross. See, friends, that's the good news of the gospel. In Romans 1.17, it says this. Romans 1.17 says that, that, that this righteousness from God is available to everyone who believes. Paul writes, for in it a righteousness from God. The gospel is what he's talking about. For in it a righteousness from God is revealed from faith. For faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. See, it's the content of the song. It's the content of the song that shapes the living of the Lord's people. And so hence what 1 John 5, 1 through 3 says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. You see, it's the love of God, it's the love of God in Christ that teaches us that we should love each other. And if God, if God in Christ provides righteousness for people from every language, tribe, and, and nation, then we ought to pursue living together by that righteousness that God has provided in Christ. Makes sense, doesn't it? See, rehearsing, yeah, rehearsing the new song to the Lord will shape the heart and will to do just that. See, worship is both the act of singing to the Lord a new song and acting out the new song between the members of the choir. So this begs the question, by whom is the song, by whom is it sung, this new song? By whom is it sung? Look at verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 98. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. So who's, who, who, by whom is it sung? Well, the new song is best sung by the multi-ethnic people of God, the church, and all of creation. Because this salvation that Christ has brought to us the salvation that God has worked by his right arm and, and his righteousness, it, it's created a people for his own possession. And so you see, Jesus, Jesus is the one who tunes the instrument of humanity and nature. And so that song, so that the song is fit to come before the Lord. And so, you know, so when you hear a song and you hear, you, and you know, it's a new song, you've been rehearsing it, you know, and begin, you begin to think, oh, you know, okay, we've sung this and we know what it's about. You know, how is it that you keep singing this same song? How is it, you know, it, doesn't that song get old? Well, you know, so the song can still be new. You know, I, I, yeah. you, can, you can hear a song over and over again and then years later you hear it again and it's like, yeah, I never noticed that in that song. Has it ever happened to you? Yeah, see, this is what the song, this new song of the Lord is like. The, song, this, the gospel in this setting is a song so grand that it requires the voices of people and angels and every living creature. It's a song whose harmonies are so blended that every ethnicity, nation, tribe, and language throughout the ages 
spends their collective life energy seeking to unify their voices around it. It's a song so beautiful that the noise of every bird isn't enough to express its splendor. It's a song so moving and rhythmic that every tree and rivers claps their hands. It's a song so robust that even the rocks are wanting to cry out. And when the redeemed of the Lord sing to the Lord the new song, every mountain is brought low and every valley is raised. And the glory of the Lord fills the temple and covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Now, I know I've been preaching to the choir, right? Well, <laughs> so here's a question. Do you know the new song? Do you know the new song? Are you a member of the choir? You see, everyone, everyone is listening to some song. Some song is your song. Some, some song is driving you, and some song is, is, is right now penetrating your heart. And there are competing songs out there, but only one that remains at the top of the charts forever. Hallelujah. It's the new song sung by the redeemed of the Lord. If Casey Kasem was talking about it, he would say it every week, at the top of the charts again, America's top 40, number one again, it's the new song. It's the new song sung by the redeemed of the Lord. Yeah, see, you, 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 you will have a song. You will have a song or you will gnash your teeth outside of the new Jerusalem when it comes down from the Father. That's what Revelation 21.8 tells us. So why not? Why not sing a new song? Why not join the choir? Join the church. Rehearsal is happening right now. It's happening right now. And so if the choir, listen, so yeah, I've been in a lot of churches over the years and, and I've been in churches you know, where, where folks, they, when they get up to sing and they say, we, we haven't rehearsed none. Sit down. You haven't rehearsed, we don't want to hear it. That's not good. Rehearse. Rehearsal is happening right now. If the choir isn't rehearsing the new song now, what makes you think you will be able to sing the new song to the Lord when you're in his presence for eternity? So if you are a member of the choir, let me ask you, let me ask you, how are you here? Are you hearing the new song? Are you hearing, how are you hearing it? Because if you're hearing the new song, you're singing it to the Lord. You set aside, set aside. And this, you know, this takes, this takes some practice. This takes some work. It takes some, some chastening of the soul to set aside your preferences because the song is to the Lord. If you're hearing the new song, you will, you will love those who are born of God, regardless of where they're from, of their background, their, their ethnicity, the color of their skin. If you're hearing the new song, the scripture says you love everyone who is born of God. If you're hearing the new song, you intentionally, intentionally reach for those who are, are outside, who are marginalized, it doesn't matter what, what's being said about them, reach, reach for them because God is calling them as well. And in listening to the new song, hear the melodies of the steadfast love of God over, you have to hear it over the news, over the media and, and, these, and their fake calls to justice, justice and righteousness from coming from God. You know, it is, it's, it's not, they're not riding or shooting in the streets or knee on the neck, nor is it political pandering. But it looks like, it looks like what Christ did for us, that he gave up his life for ours. 
That's amazing grace. That's amazing grace. The church is one foundation where our anchor holds and grips the solid rock of ages, where my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And since it's in Christ alone, our hope is found. Jesus is the center of it all, amen. Therefore, we worship the lamb who was slain and ask, is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. Hallelujah. Let the choir say amen. 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 Let's pray. Oh, our Father, that our hearts were inclined to give to you every praise. Enable us by your spirit, O oh Lord, to sing this new song. Enable us, Lord, to continually see its freshness, to make it fresh because of who you are, because of what you have done, that the praises from our lips are endless. And all of creation joins us in the chorus, singing of your greatness. Because you, O oh Lord, you alone are worthy. And we ask that you do this for the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.